Hello everyone, I'm Cecilia Tan and I will be here for the next two hours talking about my brand new book, Slow Seduction, and answering questions about whatever anyone out there would like to ask me who's on live. Um, this is the second book in my BDSM Billionaire Romance Trilogy, which is being published by Hachette. Um, officially it is the Hachette Grand Central Publishing Forever imprint. Forever is their romance imprint. Um, and uh, yes, it's very, it's very, very exciting. And no, it doesn't get old. Anyone who's out there asking, you know, doesn't it get tiring or, you know, don't you get to get used to it when new books come out? No, actually, it's really, really unbelievably cool when books arrive in the mail or when they come by download, <laughs> because now a lot of the books we do obviously are digital. Um, but what's going to happen tonight is uh, it's going to be a two hour chat, but it's going to be broken into two one hour segments. Um, because that's easier to archive on YouTube once you get over an hour. Also, a lot of people start to get lag in their streaming and so forth. So there will be one hour, and then there will be one more hour, and I'll do some questions in each. I will be reading from the book. I'll be entertaining you all, um, etc. So um, let's see. What should I tell you? So the story of Slow Surrender, this is book also, I love this visual aids thing. It's like, here's book one. Book one was called Slow Surrender. Um, and it was the first in the, it's a trilogy. Book two is the one that's out today. You can see there's a sort of pearls theme going on here. Um, it's interesting because, of course, these kind of covers that are the very tasteful, you know, whatever, the, the, especially the ones with female jewelry and so forth that are appearing, that seems to be a trend. It started, of course, like so many things these days in publishing, with Fifty Shades of Grey, which, of course, has the tie. And, you know, it's a, that's a three-book series that, you know, has these sort of male accoutrements. And then um, Sylvia Day's Crossfire series, also it's like the cufflinks sitting on the table and so forth. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that um, these are not your typical romance novels, so they should not have typical romance covers. I mean, the typical romance cover has, you know, sort of a painting of the, the hero and heroine, you know, in a embrace or, you know, whatnot, um, you know, usually very photorealistic looking. Um, you know, the Fabio sort of covers, and it's sort of like, well, these are not quite like that. Um, uh, and then the, the other thing is that these days, because so much of the commerce that goes on is on places like Amazon.com and, you know, so forth, and the internet actually has much stricter standards for what one is allowed to see visually than what a bookstore has. Um, it's sort of interesting because I've got, um, some of you may know, I run a small press called Circlet Press, and we've been in publishing for 22 years. Um, we do all kinds of erotic science fiction, uh, many of which have, you know, sort of tasteful looking covers. But um, here, I'm going to show you one, actually. I knew, I knew there was a visual aid I was going to want. Um, Amazon has been flagging some of our covers, basically, and saying, you know, no, no, you can't show that. Like, that's too dirty. These are all books that have basically been on sale on the shelf in Barnes & Noble for 20 years. But all of a sudden, they're too racy for Amazon. And the one I'm going to show you is the Actually, I had it sitting here. Is, is, believe it or not, Nobilis, you're going to laugh. The cover of The Velderet, which is one of my previous sort of BDSM-themed novels, and there is a copy of it sitting around here somewhere, but I'll, I'll sort of describe it to you. You know, it's a regular this book. is about this big, right? You know, same, same as usual. There is a naked woman about this big on the cover of the Velderette. She's very, very tiny in the very center, and it's like this big pair of eyes, you know, and whatever, in a kind of circuit board pattern. And, I mean, she's literally this big. Um, and they have flagged that as, you know, like, un unallowed, because if you squint, you can see that it is, in fact, a tiny, tiny naked woman. Like, maybe you can possibly see her nipple is this dot, <laughs> this tiny, tiny dot. And that's too much, apparently. So, um, you know... I'm like, this is a book that was stacked up in borders, you know, 10 years ago. All of a sudden it's a big deal and they can't show it. So, so the thing about these covers that are, you know, the sort of the pearls, the pearls gliding across the satin and so forth, is that if anybody objects to this, then we really, really have <laughs> a problem. Um, and that, you know, the content of these books is sort of far racier. It's, I guess it's the, the equivalent of the plain brown wrapper. Right. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. But some, sometimes you can't tell what they're going to flag either. But, you know, f fine art doesn't matter. Anything that shows, as they say, the dangly bits or, you know, anything or the pink bits, not allowed uh, now, these days on Amazon or any of the other 
ebook selling stores pretty much. Um, which is sort of interesting because of course the interior of the books is getting more and more and more graphic. <laughs> which is all to the good as far as I'm concerned. Um, but yeah, I guess part of the, I guess it has to balance out somehow, I don't know. Um, so also, you know, the, the thing that's great about books like this is that, you know, you can be reading them on the train, I guess, and people aren't like, oh my god, what is that? I mean, if they're savvy about the book business, they are. They know that this hides a, a racy interior, but if they're not, then, you know, I don't know, it, it, it just it just doesn't have the same effect as, like, Heaving Bosoms um, did, you know, or that, you know, the, I mean, it's usually the Heaving Male Bosom these days on, on romance novels. It's the giant pectoral muscles, you know, and so forth. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, book, book design is not my specialty, but I, I really am glad that they gave these, these sort of tasteful looking and, you know, nice looking covers. And I was, I felt that the, the switch from the male accoutrement of Fifty Shades to, to the, the, the pearl necklace and so forth, you know, regardless of that, that has a double meaning, of course, but, um, is that it sort of, part of the point of these books for me is that there's a sort of female empowerment message in them. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, female submission is about discovering your inner core of strength and, you know, so forth. So it's, you know, it's not about being a dish rag or, you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, it, speaking as a woman who I myself am sexually submissive, am a masochist and, you know, so forth, it's, uh, you know, yeah, I find it a very empowering experience, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm someone who, you know, runs my own company and I'm a second degree black belt and, you know, so forth and so on and, and trying to explain to people that submissive does not mean what you think it means. Um, if you think it means, uh, quiet, mousy, subservient, um, unable to make decisions, any of those things, submission, submissive does not mean any of those things, um, especially not in the, in the erotic sense. Um, it can. Some, you know, that doesn't mean that submissives can't be any of those things. I mean, you know, people of all types can be those things, obviously. Um, but that's the thing. It doesn't mean just one thing. It's, you know, a very wide range of people who, who enjoy um, erotic submission. And it's not just women. This is the other thing. People are often like, isn't BDSM bad for women? I'm like, okay, first of all, you make it sound like it's always men who are the dominants and always women who are the subs. And that is so not the case, <laughs> you know. In this romance novel, it's the case, and in what is being written in many of the popular romance novels, it's the case, but it's not in all of them. Um, uh, I think one of the reasons it's so easy for us to do just male dom, female sub, is because the dynamic in romance novels historically has been sort of domineering male, you know, the alpha male and the, you know, whatever, but she's, she's usually not subservient, she's usually feisty, right? You know, well, same, same. I think with um, with many of the female submissive characters that that we see coming out in literature now. But um, but there are dominant women too. Um, one of my favorite books ever so far is um, The Siren by Tiffany Rez. And if you are uh, looking for some hot BDSM books to read, I would highly recommend Tiffany's books. Um, I'm way behind on her series. She's got a whole bunch out that I need to I need to read them all. But I've got a stack of work reading I have to do first before I can do pleasure reading. So, um, but yeah, she's, she's got a dominatrix main character named Nora, who is just one of the great characters in erotic literature. So highly, highly recommended. Um, I'll, I'll give some more book recommendations actually as we go along. So for those of you who are watching, if you want to ask me questions, there are a couple of things you can do. One of them is if you're watching on the Ustream window, there's a little chat window. It's called social stream. You should be able to pull it down out of a menu or get it to pop up, whatever. You can type in that window and I can see what you type. Um, you can chat with each other that way also um, because it's just a little thing. The one thing is uh, it, be careful because it's a social stream. So that means I think what you post there can appear on your Twitter account if you have connected your accounts. So just FYI so that you're not spamming your entire Twitter following um, if you don't want to be. <laughs> so um, hopefully I have mine is probably still connected. So if I chat, uh, my entire following will see it, but I'll only try to put in a few things. I'll try to answer you verbally. Um, you can also text me. This is my phone number. Um, the uh, great thing about this is that I've got this in my iMessage window now. So um, you can also send it by AIM. Um, both of them appear in the same stream window for me. So um, I can't tell if you're texting me or if it's coming from AIM, in fact, probably. Um, so those will pop up in a little window for me over here. 
Um, so uh, anything you want to ask me. Meanwhile, people submitted questions to me in advance um, because I've been nagging people for like a week to say, okay, send me your questions. So I will be answering bunches of your questions. Um, I think I will be able to get to all of the ones I received in advance. So if I don't get to your question, nag me. <laughs> come come into the social stream or text me or one of these other things. So um, I can see more people are, sh are showing up in there. Um, so uh, okay, so, and I, tr I, by the way, I tried to split this so that the really spoilery questions will all come in the second half um, of the of the chat, will all come after the nine o'clock hour, and I'll try to have the unspoilery question answered in the first half, but I am, I may not, I might screw that up, so, but I will try. So those of you who don't want to be spoiled can enjoy this part, and then those of you who like to hear the juicy background details on things, on books that you haven't, pretend, pretend, sorry, potentially have not read yet, <laughs> Um, so, you know, so we'll so I, I'll talk about Slow Surrender first, since that's the one that you're more likely to have read. This is the one that has been out since last January, um, and the paperback's been out since August, so people have had a couple of months to read it. This is the book that's been on sale in Target, so, um, you know, it's kind of fun because people keep sending me photos of it in Target, um, and it's next to, like, The Hobbit <laughs> and stuff, and I'm like, that's interesting, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I never... Uh, never thought that I would uh, be next to Tolkien, other than our names both start with T, uh, you know, but yeah, I always figured there'd be plenty of people in between us, <laughs> but you know, I, Tolkien, Tan, Target, makes sense. Um, so, um, someone's asking me a question here. Uh, read the book today and loved it. Okay, so the book, <laughs> this book came out today. Some of you, I guess, are really right on there. Literally, the ebook released today and the paperback is out there. Um, have to ask, where did you get the phrase moose knuckle? Moose knuckle is a uh, is a term that means basically, you know, like when you see a guy's junk in a uh, like in a speedo or whatever, it looks like looks kind of like a moose chase, you know. So I, I think that's where it comes. I don't actually, I don't know where it comes from, but yeah, moose knuckle. It's it's the male version of the camel toe, right? Which is when your your you know your bathing suit or whatever is too tight and you see this, you know. Um, Google it. <laughs> if you want to, I'm sure that like, Google image search will probably give you all kinds of interesting things. <laughs> um, <laughs> you might want to have safe search on. Did I mention, I might have only said this in the pre-show, this show is not safe for work, so hopefully none of you are watching this uh, at work or with your with your children. After all, we are going to discuss BDSM, um, unless they are of age, you know, so, um, yeah. <laughs> So, so I, I actually, it's funny, I, I have set up the website, but I have not started populating it yet to write my memoirs, and I've decided that I had to call it Not Safe for Work, because otherwise I will never remember when I'm tweeting about it to warn people, but there's literally almost no story I can tell about my life that doesn't become unwork safe at some point. I mean, you know. I've been an erotica writer my whole adult life, <laughs> so, you know, that, and things that I don't think of as inappropriate for certain audiences, you know, of course, turn out to be, people are like, oh my god, how do, what, you know, blah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the funny thing is that, um, you know, I, my, the, the standard phrase around here is, it's not safe for work unless you work for me, because if you work here, you know, my interns and my you know, assistant editors and, you know, so forth come in and, um, you know, as soon as one of us finds something dirty on the internet, immediately we share it with the others. <laughs> so, you know, um, that that's the world I live in. <laughs> you know, it's like, check this out, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, we're, uh, but we, we know we are how the other half lives, <laughs> you know, so. Mm. Ah, so much fun. Ah, Laura Antonew has joined the social stream here. Hello. Um, all right, so first question. I, I tried to arrange these in some sort of logical order, but I don't know that I'm going to succeed in it. Um, how did you get started writing about BDSM? Someone wrote. And, um, and then someone else wrote, which did you do first, writing about it or doing it? You know, and... Um, so I put those two questions together. So the funny thing is that I started writing about BDSM before I ever did it. Um, because, uh, you know, when I was growing up, <laughs> in, in, the internet was very small and it was much more difficult sort of to meet people in real life who were, who were into kink, you know, um, and 
I had already graduated college, had moved to Boston, had moved to the big city. Um, and so I knew that there were real life kinky people out there. And I had been um, participating in some online news groups, including Alt Sex Bondage, which was, you know, in the days before websites, this is sort of, you know, sort of how people did it, right? It was kind of like a, kind of like a bulletin board system, you know, only it was in the internet. Um, and, uh, and the thing was, so, you know, I was in all of these conversations and learning, you know, just like downloading a ton of information because this is where a lot of the more experienced people who had been in the scene for decades were gathering and talking about, you know, how to do things. It was, you know, it's the early internet. So the early gatherings of people, you know, and, um, so I had read a ton, um, listened to a lot of, a lot of people posted their, would post their real life experiences where they'd say, you know, oh, here's, you know, master took me to a play party last night and here's what we did, you know, and that kind of stuff. And it's like, ah, oh, this is, this is great, you know, and it was all, you know, text-based and stuff. This was before you could post pictures and all that kind of thing. You know, our idea of those pictures was ASCII art with little asterisks and dashes and things, you know, that was about as sophisticated as it got, right? Um, you know, there were no color monitors then, you know, so, um, and I wrote a story called Telepaths Don't Need Safe Words and posted it, um, on Alt Sex Bondage. Um, that story is completely fantasy. I had never been in a dominant submissive relationship before. I completely, uh, that, those characters basically came full blown into my head the minute that I thought of the title telepaths don't need safe words. I was like, here's what's going to happen. You know, it was, and it was interesting because it was the very first time that, I mean, I had considered myself a writer for a long time and I had taken fiction writing workshops in, um, in college. And I had, you know, written reams and reams of, you know, I still have them, of course, the, you know, handwritten notebooks of, you know, this, that, and the other and character development and tried to start a novel and tried to write high fantasy and, you know, all these things. And, and I just never felt like I had written anything yet that was, complete in some way that was a whole thing that I was ready to show to the world basically and I put stuff through workshops and you know whatnot some of them were pretty decent stories but you know somehow I was just like this isn't I knew I had not hit it and then when, as soon as I wrote the story I knew I had hit it I said this is it <laughs> you know it's like this is a story it was you know and in those days of the internet it's like you could only really I don't know it was considered rude to post a post longer than like a thousand words so this one story was broken up into four scenes, <laughs> you know, and I posted them in four different posts. And it's like, it's so funny to think of that now because, you know, um, you know, now it's like, I, now I could read that on my phone, you know, <laughs> and it's just, um, so yeah, telepaths don't need safe words, uh, was my first story. And it was like a bomb dropped in, in, in my consciousness where I was just like, this is what I'm looking for. Like, this is, this is what my muse has been waiting for all this time. And the thing was, it was science fiction. It was erotica, it had BDSM, and all the characters are bisexual. And that basically meant there was absolutely nowhere I could publish this thing. I mean, nowhere. You know, the erotic places, pornography places, you know, and so forth, it was too long. They didn't want 5,000 words. They wanted 2,000 words that was all sex. They didn't want any plot, you know, they didn't want character development, any of those kinds of things, right? And, uh, and they didn't want science fiction either, because they were like, oh no, space aliens are weird. And I was like, you publish amputee porn. What, you know, how is this, how is this more weird? I don't know. You know, um, this was, this was, the, this was the kind of segregation that there was in those days. And then of course, science fiction publishers were like, oh my God, it has sex in it. Can't do that. Um, their idea was that, oh no, 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 science fiction is for, for kids. You know, it's like for 14 year olds. That's our, that's our target audience. And I'm like, you do realize that it's mostly adults that are actually buying and reading these books. But, you know, I'm, facts didn't ever enter into this kind of conversation, you know? <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So anyway, that's the story of telepaths don't need safe words. And I, you know, so I started writing about BDSM though, right, really before I did it. And then shortly, very shortly after that, you know, entered the community for, for real. <laughs> and, um, in fact, the first play party I ever went to, I hosted at a science fiction convention. <laughs> so, you know, they, they say you make your own luck. Well, you know, it's not even luck. It's just work, <laughs> you know? So just, yeah, hosted a party got a bunch of people together and, um, you know, in Tewksbury, Massachusetts at a gay lexicon. And, uh, and we had a fabulous time and yeah, tons of people who were, uh, at that party are all published authors in either science fiction or erotica now. <laughs> so uh, that was a fun party. We did not sleep till dawn anyway. Um, so yeah, so, so yes, I, but I wrote about it first. Um, now of course I have, uh, 
a wealth of exp actual experiences as a participant to draw on. But um, that just means that the well doesn't get empty. You know, I think when you're writing mostly from your imagination, you just go back to the same imaginative, you know, imaginative scenes again and again. I think I don't know sort of Anne Rice's per, you know, personal history, but I feel like when she was writing the Sleeping Beauty books, she had a couple of buttons that she just liked to push over and over again, and uh, which is great if those match your buttons. But I felt like you know, it's like, oh, Beauty gets spanked again. You know, it's like, couldn't we have a little variation? I don't know. I like a lot of variation. And the great thing about having lived the varied life that I have had <laughs> is that I've had lots of experiences of different things. And so I get to put a lot of different things in. Um, so someone's asking me what year that was 1992, I think, possibly 93. It was the Gay Lexicon in Tewksbury. It might have been 93. It was July. I think it was July 93. Um, there was only one gay lexicon that was in Tewksbury, so you should be able to look it up pretty easily. Um, and uh, someone else says, I've clearly been going to the wrong science fiction conventions. Well, it's funny is that throwing that party started a spate of people throwing BDSM parties at science fiction conventions. We did one that same year at PhilCon, and then I never had to be involved in actually hosting the party again because so many other people picked up that ball and ran with it that after that, for you know a good decade, I just got invited to them. So, and many of them, I mean, the ones at PhilCon and whatever were, were open. They were not, you had to have, know where it was, you know, it was, you just had to sign the waiver at the door and go through. And, and that when we threw at PhilCon, I think it was like, there were 1,500 people at that PhilCon and something like 400 of them came through um, the BDSM party. Um, and then, you know, of course we shred the names afterwards, but um, the, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of interesting. It, it, it was a moment in, in the 90s. Um, and uh, someone's commenting, yes, and it ended with Disclave 97. Um, it didn't really, actually, but it went a little more underground. Um, the uh, and, and then some of the conventions that used to have sort of infamously large parties, also the, um, some of them, the parties became so big that they separated off into separate hotels and, you know, now are their own event. The other thing is now there's so many BDSM conventions to go to. Back then, there, there were not as many leather and BDSM events that you could go to, but there were lots of science fiction conventions and, you know, that's just where there were a lot of kinky people, you know, <laughs> so now there's, you know, you have a lot of choices. There's lots and lots of things you can go to. I'm the, um, I'm the creator of a thing called the Fetish Fair Flea Market, um, which, uh, is going on in coming this March in Providence. It's been going on for 22 years also. And um, the New England Leather Alliance runs the one in New England. And uh, it used to be in Providence. It was there for many years, but uh, recently moved to Warwick. So going to be in a new hotel this year. I'm not involved anymore. It's flying on its own. They're, they're, you know, they're running it. I'm going to go and teach some classes and sign books and whatnot like that. But um, yeah, it's kind of exciting to see something that I started and, you know, it draws thousands of people. Um, and that's really cool. And, you know, and continues to be really cool that, that people have a place where they can just go for a very small amount of money. I think it's 20 bucks to get in, look at the vendors, attend the classes, see what's going on. You know, it's not one of these, oh, it's 250 bucks and we won't even tell you where the, you know, we won't even tell you where the hotel is until after you've registered. And it's like, no, we advertise in the newspaper. It's, you know, this, that, the other. Often it's funny because we'll have people you know, some people still have this idea somehow that BDSM and fetish is like pseudo illegal and it, it's not. <laughs> um, and they'll do things like they'll call the police and be like, do you know what's going on at such and such hotel? And the police will be like, yeah, we have, uh, they hire our guys to, you know, do crowd control and, and traffic, you know, flow and <laughs> all that kind of a thing. And they're like, yeah, we've got a couple of people down there right now. Why? <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, you know, it's just, Exactly. Yeah, we're actually not all that different from, I don't know, an anime convention or a, I don't know, a lot of other things, except that everyone at our convention is 18 years or up, you know. I'm a tea addict. That's one thing you should know about me, is that if there's, if there's not a steady influx of tea, basically I just run down like an automaton that isn't wound up. Um, <laughs> it's... <laughs> You know, and, and it can even be like an herbal tea, a decaffeinated tea. This is the second steeping of something. So, you know, it's got no caffeine in it at all. This is just, I just can't live without it. Um, 
Anyway, all right, second question. Um, someone asked, is it okay to read book two first? No. Um, well, I mean, you can, obviously. You're adults, so you can do what you want. But I would read book one first, since book two is, um, you know, it's a trilogy. It's not three standalone novels that just happen to involve the same characters. I mean, there's, there's you know, major events that take place in book one that you can't really understand, I think, a lot of the emotional stuff that's going on with Karina, our main character, in book two, unless you have read book one. Um, so I would say read book one first. It's three dollars and seventy nine cents on Amazon in ebook, so you know, go go ahead, <laughs> take take the plunge. Then you can read book two. Um, and uh, the um, and this leads to the question that someone else said: Why is everything a trilogy? The answer to that is very simple, and it is called Fifty Shades of Grey, um, which is that when publishers saw how popular those books were. Um, they said, well, you know, they of course want to know why, and it's, it's like, it can't just be that there's some BDSM in it, because we've been writing kinky books for a very long time, um, and it can't just be that it's romance, because romance is romance, you know, um, romance is the best-selling, uh, category of fiction that there is, so, okay, fine. Um, why is everything a trilogy? <laughs> so, but Fifty Shades was a trilogy, and they said, well, obviously people like these longer works where you get more time with the characters and it's not just like the one shot you know a lot of people read a romance novel in one day and then it's sort of over with characters are gone it's like seeing a movie and it's gone whereas you know seeing like a mini series or a you know something with episodes you kind of live with them a little bit longer and i originally proposed this as a single book um it did not have as much plot and as many interesting things would could not happen then but it was, you know, originally meant to just be sort of one book. Um, and then publisher came back to me and said, no, you know, we, we'd really like it to be three books. And, you know, I was like, oh, darn, I have to read three books, you know. <laughs> the, um, and it is fun to spend more time with the characters and get to do more with them. But at the same time, I understand people's frustration that now it seems like, it seems like a lot of the single shot novels are disappearing from the shelves. And so, you know, people are sort of, I can understand, you know, people being frustrated with that. Um, and of course there has to be a cliffhanger, you know, so I, uh, I'm sorry, that's the kind of delayed gratification top that I am, <laughs> you know, but uh, it's, it's, it's requirement of the form. I actually originally just had one horrible cliffhanger, not two. And my editor was basically like, nope, nope. You've definitely got to leave them hanging at the end of book two also. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, fine. And it, Granted, by the time we get to the end of book two, Karina, our main character, has realized a bunch of things, and she, in fact, does have some issues that she needs to be worked out. So, um, yes, Tolkien is also to blame. Tolkien is why all high fantasy books have to be trilogies, and Fifty Shades of Grey is why all romance now. And it's not all romance, but it's why it is such a trend right now. And, um, and yes, it is fun to get to play with the characters for longer. I mean, you know, it, it is. But um, the, the thing about a romance is essentially you are constantly ratcheting up the emotional stakes for the characters. And the longer the book is, the more you can have at stake. The longer the characters are together, the more in love they can be, the more deeper the, you know, the emotions can get, the more vulnerable they can become to each other. And so by the time book three comes along, you know, um, yeah, I can't say anymore without spoiling it. <laughs> but you know, yes, so, um, but this, that's, that's why it's a trilogy, and, uh, and in book three, I get to bring it all home, basically, you know, so, um, book one takes place in New York, book two takes place in England, mostly, and then book three, there's a little bit, actually, in Karina's hometown in Ohio, there's a little tiny bit in New York, and the rest of it is in Las Vegas, um, which is kind of interesting. I think I got the erotica, um, the Erotic Authors Association had a convention in, in Las Vegas uh, about two years ago, and uh, and I think it left quite an impression on me. So we were in a hotel that was directly across from the Bellagio, um, and uh, so there's a whole scene. <laughs> there's a whole scene in front of the fountains of the Bellagio and whatnot like that. But anyway, uh, but that's for book three. There's a little teaser for book three. Um, book two... I'll tell you a little bit more about book two. This is not a spoiler, but yeah, book, book two takes place in England. And um, one of the questions actually people says, did your trip to England influence this book? Um, it, di it did, you know, and 
I, you can do a lot of research on the internet, but having been to a place, I think, really gives you, gives you stuff that you don't even know. Um, it's, you don't even realize that you've internalized somehow, and it's, you don't know which details are going to be the detail you need until you go to write the scene. So, um, the, uh, um, I went to present actually at a conference in York on romance. It was a scholarly conference on romance, the Yasper conference, I-A-S-P-R. Sorry, I can't spell while I'm talking. Um, the, the International Association for the Study of Popular Romance, um, and uh, which is great fun. Got to be academic um, <laughs> and, and all that. And, uh, you know, present on, do some close readings of romance novels and write a paper about them and you know yes I really really enjoyed doing it this is why I used to be a Ravenclaw um, anyway that's another story is how I went from being a Ravenclaw to being a Slytherin but that's another story you have to wait to another book to hear that one anyway I got to go to York and present this thing and whatever so a bunch of this book a little bit of this book takes place in New York a bunch of it takes place in London um, and it's funny because these kinds of coincidences happen to you when you're writing a book, or at least they happen to me. I don't know if that happens to everybody, but, um, the, uh, so one, one of the questions here, let me see, where was it, um, was about, so people, you know, you, you have to, when you are writing a romance novel or any novel, you have to figure out, okay, what am I, what does my character do for a living? What are their, um, you know, yeah, what are their quirks, what, you know, what's their background, what part of the country are they from, what's their accent like, you know, you have to figure all these things out, right, and sometimes a whole bunch of it comes to you at once, and then other times you have to kind of figure stuff out, but I'm, you know, I'm sitting down, I'm trying to plan, when I was writing the proposal, you know, I'm trying to plan what it is, and of course, I knew that th this book was going to be, com this, this trilogy, was going to be compared to, um, it was going to be compared to Fifty Shades of Grey, I mean, you knew it, that the first thing people are going to do is they're like, it's a BDSM billionaire trilogy, it's, that is a whole category now, which is, you know, the foundational book of that is Fifty Shades. So it's going to be compared. And I said, all right, well, if that's the case, then I want to um, make some specific choices that are in sort of in response to it. And one of them is that, you know, our main character in Fifty Shades is supposed to be a college student, right? And I'm like, okay, well, then I'm going to make mine a graduate student. <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, just yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, and then I thought, okay, well, what's she study? And I'm like, well, I didn't want it to be, I didn't want to be, didn't want it to be anything in the sciences. It would be too complicated. And I didn't want it to be a, um, you know, so, it, and, and I thought, okay, the other thing is when you're deciding who, what your characters are going to be and whatever, I said, it's a romance novel. There's going to be a lot of sex and there's going to be a lot of relationship processing, but they have to have some subject in common that they can talk about other than that. You know, it's like they have to have a subject which they can discuss, which is not sex and is not their relationship. Um, and I said, okay, how about art? That sounded really good to me. Um, so I made Karina, uh, a, Karina's writing her thesis in book one on pre-Raphaelite art. I honestly did not know hardly anything about pre-Raphaelite art. I just knew I liked it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I knew almost nothing. Like, uh, beyond that, you know, honestly, I could have named you maybe one pre or two pre-Raphaelite artists. Not kidding. Um, but it sounded good, right? And and this, this is the way your subconscious works. Like your subconscious is more in tune sometimes with what's going on than your sort of your forebrain. And I'm like, okay, pre-Raphaelite art, right? Fine. So that's in the proposal. Then later I'm writing the book and I'm like, oh, okay, I better learn something about pre-Raphaelite art so that Karina will have something to say, you know? So I start looking at pre-Raphaelite art and it turns out that there's all these to me, what it seemed to me obvious sort of SM undertones in pre-Raphaelite art. <laughs> and I mean, is it, I'm like, is it just me? You know, whatever. So, um, yeah, kind of funny. But the, um, uh, so actually I'm going to see if I can send you guys a link. The uh, Karina's favorite piece of pre-Raphaelite art, which gets discussed a bunch of times, is one called King Kofatua and the Beggar Maid. And I'm going to... There. I think it, it may have just tweeted it also, but there. That's that's a link to the Wikipedia page, which which shows the art. And um, to me, there's a lot of sort of power dynamics and things going on in this piece of art. Um, and uh, Nebulus just said, oh, no, not sure why. <laughs> Hope everything's okay over there. Um, the uh, So, you know, 
you give gifts to yourself. Your subconscious seems to give gifts to you when you're writing. And um, so here's the thing. I go to, on to this academic conference in the UK and it's, you know, it's in York because you have to pass through London, right? So I, um, you know, fly into Heathrow. I'm going to sleep overnight in London. I'm going to get on the train to York, going to go to York and I come back and then I was going to sleep over one night and then fly back, right? You know, it's just, didn't really have the money at the time to, to do much more than that. But I had still have this one whole day or two nights, I guess I stayed in London, right? So I've got one whole day to spend in London. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to do on this one day? In book two, what Karina goes to London for is this exhibit of Pre-Raphaelite art. It's like the only time that all the pre raphs art has been collected together by a major gallery. I made that up completely, completely invented that. I show up in London and I look to see what's happening and at the Tate Gallery, you know, at the Tate London, the big British art museum where there is a huge amount of uh, renovation going on right now, what's happening? A giant exhibition of pre-Raphaelite art. I'm like, did I, did I sort of psychically pick that out of the ether? <laughs> you know what? I really, really just, I made that up. I made that up, but it's happening right now. So of course I had to go and see it. Um, and, you know, run, I was at the museum, you know, when the doors opened, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. And, you know, and it's, it's so, it's this huge exhibition, you know, whatever. And uh, I took pictures, you know, this, that, the other, and it was just, you know, um, I'll be doing a blog post later this week about that um, and whatnot, but yeah, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this, so a bunch of scenes in the book um, take place in the gallery um, and whatnot. In fact, maybe I'll read a scene right now. Um, so uh, th this will not be, I, I will not tell you too much about this. This will not be completely spoilery, but um, it, it probably won't surprise you terribly much given that it is a trilogy and that I had to leave cliffhangers that just like in Fifty Shades of Grey at the end of each book our main pair is split up for whatever reason right so um, here we are at uh, here we are in the gallery and uh, Karina has been um, hired by essentially a curator there to give private tours to rich donors after hours of the of the art you know kind of a thing by the way I so this is completely made up I do not believe that the tape actually allows you to do this no matter how much money you give them um, but you know but what do I know I mean <laughs> so um, so she you know she is ostensibly in London to do this she's actually really there to search for James right but um, but doesn't you know hasn't hasn't found him you know this is still early in the book We're only on page 30 something right um, and our the curator introduces her to this, what's clearly, you know, a sort of young, rich businessman. And he's got these two women following him around, um, who don't speak, you know, and she's like, she, she kind of senses there's a kinky vibe from them, but she doesn't really know and, you know, whatever. And he's arrogant as fuck. So here's, here's the first scene with her and, and Damon George, who is the, the rich, the rich antagonist. <laughs> Um, some people are saying goodbye. <clears throat> the lights were already on full brightness as we stepped into the first gallery. I took a deep breath, preparing to launch into a speech about the founding of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, but he stopped me before I could start. Karina Casper, he said. May I call you Karina? You can call me Damon instead of Mr. George. Um, sure. I tried to guess his age. 30, maybe? Is there something in particular you want to know about the pre-Raphaelites? Perhaps, or perhaps I merely wish to commune with the art. He clucked his tongue and walked down the first row of paintings, the two women trailing behind him like obedient pets. Given that they reminded me of the people I'd seen and met at that kinky ball, I wondered if they were under an order of silence. Maybe I was too, after that comment about communing with the art. He was clearly as arrogant as they came. I reminded myself he was a major donor, and kissing his ass was my job. So I followed along like one of the pets. He said nothing till we came to the famous image of Ophelia drowning herself. Surely you can see that this painting is about violence against women, he said. How dare they show this in public? I nearly rose to the bait, except it was so obvious he was saying something outrageous to get a rise out of me, and I didn't want to give him that satisfaction. 
Our mission is to preserve and display the art, I said in my best tour guide voice, not to condone any particular interpretation of it. Any great work of art will have multiple interpretations. In fact, I'd say the greater the art, the more interpretations there will be. He sniggered. Very politically correct, my dear. What wouldn't have been politic would be to say what I was really thinking, which is that I didn't give a damn what his opinions were on art, or anything, the arrogant prick. But I gave him my waitress smile, and we moved on. He didn't linger over many of the paintings, skimming along until we came to the final gallery. Now here are the really sexy ones, he said, opening his arms wide as if he were going to give the nudes of Andromeda a hug. I should have known these would be his favorite paintings. Andromeda was the only nude in the whole exhibit. Depicted in three large paintings by Burne Jones, Andromeda is rescued by Perseus from the sea serpent that is about to eat her. Actually, I have a link to this one also that I'm going to send to you guys so that you can see the art I'm talking about. Something that people in the uh, people who are just reading the book will not get. I'm going to. Sorry, the tweet was a little too long. There we go. Perseus paintings. Um, the three in particular that you want to look at are. Oh, it, it's telling me I can't post that often. Here we are. The uh, the Rock of Doom, Doom fulfilled, and the Baleful Head. So you can see them. Um, Depicted in three large paintings by Burne Jones, Andromeda is rescued by Perseus from the sea serpent that is about to eat her. In the first, there's a kind of love at first sight moment where she's naked against the rocks and he takes off his helmet to look at her. In the second, we see her back turned while Perseus wrestles with the black coils of the sea serpent. And in the last, she's clothed and they are bending over a font together so Perseus may show her the head of Medusa in the reflection. It struck me suddenly that Andromeda's dress in the final painting was strikingly similar to the one worn by the beggar maid. I stepped closer to examine it. You have it backward, you know, Damon said, stepping close and talking quietly into my ear the way you would if the gallery were crowded with people. Since it wasn't, I stepped aside, but he kept going. You read it right to left, but the real story is the other direction. What are you talking about? I frowned, wondering what nonsense he was spouting this time. Was he trying to get a rise out of me again? It, it follows the mythical tale. Ah, but that's the thing. You're supposed to see it as the great and mighty Perseus tamed and domesticated by the beautiful girl. The first thing he does, uncover his head, then cut off the head of the snake, and in the end show her how safe and tame the snake head of Medusa is. In other words, he emasculates himself for her, the snake, the head, and the sword, all being phallic symbols. So, that's still reading it from left to right. I know. That was the acceptable story to the Victorians, but the real story is the other way. It begins tame. Fool, he fools her into thinking he's safe, and by the end, he's about to put his helmet on and ravish her. That's ridiculous. Ancient Greek was read from right to left, not left to right, he said smugly. I racked my brain, trying to remember everything I knew about these paintings. I was fairly sure that Burne Jones had painted three or four more of Perseus, but I didn't know the dates so I could prove him wrong. How do you know so much about Greek culture, anyway? He laughed and turned to face me in front of the painting. Don't you think there's a resemblance? The crazy thing is, there was. He could have been Perseus come to life, but with a much more annoying smirk. I still didn't make the connection, though. George is anglicized from Georgiades, he said, so let's just say I know my Greek. Fine. A very interesting theory, Mr. Georgiades. Damon, please. His eyebrow arched with mischief, and I knew he was about to say something else designed to get a rise out of me. I only enjoy formality in those I'm fucking. I knew it. Well, if I thought he was going if he thought he was gonna shock me, he was wrong. Is that why your companions don't speak? I asked, and don't have names. His grin widened with delight. You're very perceptive, Karina. I wouldn't have guessed you for the type, but then people never do. I suppose you went through the whole slap and tickle nightclub scene in New York? No, I said coldly, not really. Hmm. He merely gave me a nod, then turned back to the painting behind him. He snapped his fingers, and the two women fell into a sudden embrace, kissing each other. I took a step back. You're welcome to stay and watch, Karina, but if it's too much for you, all I ask is, oh, about seven minutes of privacy? Are you 
you kidding me? I can't leave you alone with these paintings. That was a much more shocking idea than that he had two sex slaves following him around. Oh, it dawned on me then that he'd brought them to the gallery specifically to get off. No wonder he paid a huge sum to have a private after-hours viewing of the art. Even if I promise we won't touch them. At the word touch, he rubbed the length of his cock through his trousers. I wasn't about to let that distract me. I'm sorry, Mr. George, but I don't know you well enough to trust you. Just because you're rich doesn't mean you're honorable. He bowed his head. All too true. I suppose you'll have to stay, then. I'm going to leave you hanging there. Ha ha, because that is the kind of top I am. <laughs> have to buy the book to find out what else happens. But I get to play with a lot of, um, I get to play with a lot of, sort of SM community tropes and as well as fantasy SM tropes, you know, when, whenever you write about these things. And they, romance already has this kind of love-hate relationship with fantasy where it's like, you know, um, you want it to be really realistic so that your emotions can get really engaged, but then you don't want it to be so realistic that, you know, it, there, there have to be these unrealistic expectations in some ways about, you know, their, um, I don't know, the, the size of their throbbing member and whatnot. But, um, and, um, and I, I know I'm making fun of it, but I, I mean it sincerely in that if you don't have these certain elements of sort of that, that you can hang your fantasy on, then, then, then it fails. I mean, it is meant to be a romance. It is meant to transport you to somewhere. And since I'm used to writing science fiction and fantasy already, I didn't have any problem with, you know, um, sticking to certain conventions, <laughs> you know, but, um, yes, uh, the, the, the difference be, the, where I get to play with it is, the, it is that line between real BDSM and fantasy BDSM. And um, that's the thing that I tried to do is the BDSM is all extremely realistic, you know, as far as I'm concerned. It's the way that it might actually happen. But some of the places it happens and some of the people it happens with maybe are not, you know, are not as realistic, but I don't know. Um, but, you know, my own life is a really bad gauge of what's realistic and what's not, because this is one of the reasons I need to write my memoirs, because most of you will never believe that half the things that have happened to me have happened to me. So, you know, <laughs> that's a story for another book. Yes. Um, the, uh, all right, let's have a couple more questions. Um, and remember, you guys can ask me questions. I can see the little things going by here. Um, so... Um, Elizabeth's uh, recommending the book Pleasure Bound, Victorian Sex Rebels and the New Eroticism uh, about the Pre-Raphaelites and their coterie. Very good book, she says. I Yes, I, I, I bet it is, and I should probably get it. <laughs> yeah. Now that now that I suddenly have to make myself into a pseudo-expert on Pre-Raphaelites, um, I did buy the, uh, um, the, you know, the catalog from the, from the exhibit as well, but um, it's, uh, actually, no, maybe I didn't because I couldn't, it couldn't, it, it was so heavy that it was going to make my luggage overweight <laughs> and, and, and there was no way that I was going to carry it by hand. Um, uh, I think I might've decided I was going to mail order it and I don't think I did. All right. I clearly have to remedy that. Hopefully it can just be, you know, mail ordered from their website or something. Well, now, now that exhibit is going, is traveling around. It was just in DC and I think it's going to be in, I think it's somewhere else now. It's, it's going around the U S now though. So I thought, okay, well, I'll be able to order it from, a museum on this side of the ocean, most likely, you know, and, and not have to pay to ship this 30 pound book or whatever it is. Okay. It's not that heavy, but it's pretty heavy. Um, it was more than my, my poor shoulders would take. Um, all right. A couple more questions. Um, uh, there, one is, there was a lot about art in this book. Why? And, you know, I told you why, but they said, do you have a background in art? Not really, you know, I, I have, I only, I have an artist's interest in art in that, you know, as a creative person, I'm, fascinated by other forms of creativity and, you know, so forth. And, you know, yeah. And, and the pre-Raphaelites are re really, yeah, they, they were the punk rockers of their day, basically. So of course I, of course I love them. Um, do you listen to music when you write? One of the questions I got. And, um, it's interesting because I, I used to listen to a lot of, um, I used to listen to a lot of industrial music when I wrote, um, and, uh, sort of in goth industrial, um, but I, I reached a point about 10 years ago where I, I need to have music that doesn't have words a lot of the time when I'm writing or the words somehow get mixed up in my ears and what I'm writing. Um, 
and uh, so I switched to a lot of all instrumental, you know, new age, world beat soundtracks, you know, a lot of stuff like that. Um, and the, the stuff that doesn't get mixed up is stuff that I heard millions of times in the 90s. So then it's like those words don't sink in the way, like if I try to listen to the radio or something, you know, it's like too many voices talking um, or, you know, or, or an album I haven't heard before, you know. I, I, it's like I pay too much attention to it and I need I need it to be more in the background for me to write but actually while writing while writing slow surrender I listened to a lot of David Bowie um, and uh, the which will surprise none of you I mean if you didn't catch all the David Bowie references in it it's there's probably one on every page <laughs> I mean you know so the um, people will say well you know where, where did your hero come from my hero for me is the David Bowie that I fell in love with when I was a young teenager. Um, the, uh, you know, so James is, you know, that that's my, that's my model for James. And if you want, I was saying before that I had made this, I knew we were going to have these comparisons to Fifty Shades of Grey. It's very obvious reading Fifty Shades that her, you know, image, because it was, it was Twilight fanfic. It was not even the Twilight books, I think, but so much is the Twilight movies and that she's picturing um, Robert Pattinson right, as the, uh, as her hero. Well, you know, the, 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 the sexy pseudo-androgynous vampire of my youth was David Bowie in The Hunger. <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of, um, that's where that connection sort of comes in. And, uh, and I needed, I needed a hero who was interesting enough for me to write three books about, um, you know, so honestly, so I, I can fantasize endlessly about David Bowie. So, you know, um, that's, that's where that comes from. The, uh, so while writing Slow Surrender, I um, did a, uh, it, like, people have made these, you know, like these David Bowie, like, YouTube lists where it's like 75, story, you know, songs, whatever, including live ones and rare ones and, you know, whatever. And it's like, okay, this is better than the radio in a way. You know, it's like I can just put that on, put it in my headphones and, you know, whatever. And, and because I'm familiar with so many of those songs, again, they don't, they weren't, like, interfering somehow. But, um when I wrote Slow Seduction, by then I was had kind of run through um, a lot of that, sort of, and I, I went back to, you know, just The Cure and um, Otmar Liebert, you know, and uh, um, if you don't know Otmar Liebert, he's a guitar, guitar player who plays a sort of pseudo-flamenco, you know, sort of flamenco fusion, if you want to call it that. Very, very good stuff. Um, oh, I see. Deborah's there. She says, I require a lot of world music too. <laughs> and here's a question. How much of your writing process involves research and does this slow down or catalyze the process? Research stops it dead um, is one of the things. So, you know, I'll be writing along and writing along. And let me tell you, if there's anything that, you know, that makes, gives you the urge to procrastinate, it's like, oh yeah, I'll read this entire book about such and such a thing before I get back to writing my book. It's terrible, and, you know, and or as as we call it, there's there's writing, and then there's right surfing, <laughs> which is where you know you go to look up one little thing like on Wikipedia to make sure that you know oh you know how long does it take to take the train from Canterbury to Scotland, you know, or whatever, and you look, and the next thing you know, you've read ten other articles about this and about that and whatever, and it's like, you know, wait a minute, that, you know, that was my writing time, and so I I, I try to 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 not mix it up too much. But there are times though when you get stuck where you're like, okay, I can't move forward until I look up this thing. Eh, you know, so um, the great thing about writing science fiction and fantasy is that I don't get stuck by research as much. Whereas in real world books, it's like you really, you know, I really wanted to get things right. And yeah, people, some, for some people are like, oh, you know, it's England, who cares? I'm like, people in England care, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I, you know, I want to get it right. If you're, I'm going to set it in the real world, it had better be you know, as realistic as I can make it, you know, so yes, it takes this many hours for the train to go from here to there and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, uh, lunch costs this much and, you know, whatnot. And there were things that the copy editor queried, you know, from time to time about it, about England, you know, and, and I'd be like, okay, if that might be true, but it's not believable, then I might have to change it to something that both the American audience will understand and uh, you know, but which is still accurate, you know, that kind of a thing, like what, what they're eating or something, you know, um, the, uh, what was it? We had some kind of, we had some kind of argument over Cornish pasties, I think. <laughs> and I was like, all right, never mind. Let's just make it a, make it a roast beef sandwich or something, you know, that kind of a thing where you're just like, you know, you don't want it to be a speed bump, 
that kicks anybody out of the story, you know, people go, what? What is that? You know, you, you want everything to be smooth and just pouring straight into the reader so that they're receiving the experience that, you know, you're sending them on. You don't want them to be questioning constantly and being like, wait, what is that? How is that? You know, the stuff I want them to be questioning is like, oh, what's going on with the relationship there? Oh, what's that thing there? You know, or, ooh, ooh, you know, what's going to happen with that, with that sex toy or that, that twist of his past, you know, and so forth. So those are the things that, you know, um, so, all right, we're coming up on the top of the hour. At, <laughs> old DJ me is like, we're coming up on the top of the hour. Um, at, I'm just going to warn you now. What I'm going to do at that point is stop the broadcast and then start it again. So those of you who are starting to experience streaming video lag and so forth, we'll be able to reset and we'll all come back into the chat room and everything. Um, and we'll just pick right up there. I've got a bunch more questions. Um, and I would like to give away a copy of the book. Um, and I have not come up with what's the right method is for this. I didn't plan this part far, far enough ahead. So of all of you who are in the chat, um, you know, I think I'm going to make you all email me or something and, um, you know, that kind of a thing. So <laughs> yes, um, the, uh, ah, sigh. <laughs> the, um, okay. So the reason I keep looking down is there's a cat right here at my feet who is like, the thing is, I think he wants to get in my lap, and I've been kind of trying to keep him from doing so. It's like, I'm wearing, it's like, dear, I'm wearing black velvet. You know, you're going to cover me with white cat hairs to, you know. Not that any of you probably have any illusions about what a crazy cat lady I am, given that you probably all follow me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but So you've seen the daily cat pictures of my crazy cats. Okay, now he's now he's over there. That's Oolong, who is my, my constant companion. He's a... Uh, um, follows me around the house and so forth. And there, then you've got two brothers who are also around, but they're, you know, they're napping somewhere else right now. Whereas Oolong's always like, what are you doing, mom? What's, what's going on in your world right now? Can you be petting me also while you're doing that? Like, yes, dear, I can pet you. I, I, I've gotten very good at, he, he'll hang on one arm, basically, put his paws over one arm and I'll sort of type while he's draped across my forearms. So, you know, uh, bye Bernie. Nice to see you. Um, all right. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to stop the broadcast, and then we'll um, we'll start it again. So just let everybody refresh your windows, um, and I will see you in 60 seconds.